tonight I'm going to speak about something really, really basic, very fundamental, but something that you may be surprised when you look at your own life, that there's still maybe some things the Lord wants to establish or do in this area, something he wants to show you. And it's on this theme that you are fully pleasing to God right now, here and now. You're fully pleasing to God. It doesn't matter how well you've been doing in your walk or in your ministry. You are fully pleasing to God. And that's more than a nice idea. It's actually absolute solid biblical truth. And it's really important that we gain a grasp on that if we don't already. If I was to ask you to give a score, a percentage of how you're doing as a Christian, how you're doing in your walk, in your ministry, If I was to say, well, imagine that God had a scorecard and he was going to put down your percentage of where you are today, uh, you know, with your walk. You don't have to don't have to say, but but think about what score you think would be on there. Does everyone have a score in mind? Something rough, a rough idea. Out of what? Out of 100 percentage wise. Do you have a percentage, Harry? God doesn't keep score. Thank you, Harry. God doesn't keep score. Did anyone have a percentage in mind, or was anyone trying to figure out a percentage? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I would have been too. It's a genuine question, but it's it's not really a trick. It's to show us that this is one way of thinking, but it's not God's way. And until literally a week ago, I would have, I had a percentage in mind for myself. (laughs) Hundred and one. He's on four tonight. He is on four. (laughs) But he doesn't actually have a scorecard. That's not how God works, is it, Harry? No, not not at all. Now, but that's more than a nice idea. Oh, God doesn't keep a scorecard. We're going to see that in the scriptures tonight. So Romans five one is the first scripture, and it says. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have been, so this is something that's done already. We have been justified, justified meaning being put right with God, that everything is okay between God and us. We've been justified. We've been justified by faith. So our relationship with God has been put right by simply believing. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We're at peace with God. He's at peace with us. And it's through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's already been done. We are right with God. It's through simple faith. This has happened already. We've put our trust in Jesus. That's happened in the past. And we have peace with God. And it's all through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we stand before God completely at peace with him. And crucially, we live before God completely at peace with him. And that actually doesn't depend on, you know, how well we're doing or not doing. Our sins and failures are forgotten. That's a permanent state. Our sins and failures are forgotten. There's absolutely no strife between us and God. That's what it means to have peace with God. Absolutely no strife. And there's no disappointment on God's side. God is not ever disappointed with you. I'll repeat that because that may not be the way you may have looked at it. He's never disappointed with you. We can get disappointed with each other and with ourselves, but God is never disappointed with you. Why? Well, because we're justified through our Lord Jesus Christ and we have peace with God. There's no strife between us. Our sins and all our failures and mistakes and shortcomings are just they're forgotten. And we stand and live before him completely at peace. So this is, our, this, is, this is where we are. It's been done. No scorecard. It's not there. Second verse that we'll look at to show the foundations for this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 
for our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So if we think of all our sin, all our failure, all our mistakes, all our shortcomings, and God put that all on Jesus. And in Jesus, all of that was put to death. All of our failure and shortcoming. Why? So that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. So on one side, you've got all the sin, the failure, the shortcoming, you know, the missing of the mark. And that's all gone in Jesus who died. And on the other side, you've got the goodness and righteousness of God. And that's in Jesus who was raised from the dead and we're in him. So we are in Jesus, the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God in Jesus. So I have to ask, when... Are you the righteousness of God? When are you the goodness of God, Lee? Always. Always. Yes. Always. When are you at peace with God, Kate? Always. That's what it says, isn't it? <laughs> when is your sin not counted against you at all? James. Uh, always. Always. It's never, <laughs> never counted against us. Why? Because we're in Jesus. So to God, you and I are like Jesus because we're in Jesus. And Jesus is fully pleasing to God. I have a question. Yes. What about the times when you do sin? And that, where does that put you? Is God disappointed? Probably. No. Well, hang on. Because where is that sin? Where's it gone? It's, it's buried. It's been put to death in Jesus. Right, but the practicalities of living, mm -hmm. we aren't sinless, are we? Correct. We do sin. Yes. So in those moments when you sin... It's not on your scorecard. It's not counted okay. against... There is no scorecard. It's not counted against you. I'm just playing devil's advocate there. That's, that's fine. And that is the devil. That's how he speaks. Not the... <laughs> You're playing a good role. You're playing a good role of devil's advocate. How can you put that in the context of repentance? Because you repent when you feel that, when you recognize that God's heart is completely different to what you've done and that that's not what he wanted you to do. Mm -hmm. So you have fallen short of what he, what 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 <clears throat> his his standard is, mm -hmm. and also, of course, you if if it's true repentance, and you also feel that in yourself, and you feel that that's not where you want to be yourself. So how does that? How do you fit that into? Are you justified before God? Of course, in 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 being in being saved, yeah. Are you? Do you have peace with God? Well, according to the Bible, you have peace with God through faith and not through how well you perform or don't perform. I'm not talking about performance, though, but like it's just the details of the matter. Like if you are constantly resisting repentance, then there's no way you can be at peace with God. But then that's the element of choice where you have to choose to have faith in God and in doing so then you can have peace with them. But it's not on God. It's not anything God has to do to be at peace with us. It's, some old, it's, it's what we have to do, accepting him. We have peace with God through faith yeah. in Jesus. And yeah. that faith is there because you're a Christian. So you have peace with God. You're justified before him. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. Right? That's who you are. And your sin isn't counted against you. It's forgotten. Yes. There's a difference between feeling at peace with God and actually positionally being at peace with God. Because yeah. when you sin, praise God, you get convicted. So that's not a pleasant process because you know, mm, sure, I shouldn't have said that. Or, you know what, 
I should have done that. You can feel that short, sharp conviction. You know, okay, well, I was wrong. So that moment, you don't feel peace. You're not feeling at peace in yourself, are you? Because you've seen. Right. But positionally, in other words, what you're saying and what Jesus has done, you are. Yes. Because he's already. Oh, yeah. So it's just, I just thought it's important to establish the difference between feeling. <laughs> yes. And actually being, being at peace. Being at peace. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. right. Yes, Kate. If you're not resisting God, if you just have, you miss the marking of that sudden conviction of the Holy Spirit and then you repent, I don't see that your peace with God is actually broken because you just realize, oops, shouldn't have done that, you repent. But if you're resisting his spirit and not doing something that God wants you to do for a period of time, then I would imagine then there's conflict going on within your soul because you're not submitting to what God wants. But if you just miss the mark, and you repent, I don't see that your peace with God has to be broken. I think the point that needs to be made is that there is no scorecard. Yes. So whether it's whether you like, oh, I've just missed the mark, so I'm down to 99% here, or whether it's like you've literally completely gone off the, off the rails in something, so you're on like 2%. There is just no scorecard. It's just not there. God keeps no record of wrongs. And this is a hard thing for us to grasp and take into account. But it is like James said, through faith, through the Lord Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. That's a fact. Through, through the Lord Jesus Christ, we are the goodness of God. That's a fact. That's who he's made us to be. Because through Jesus, who is fully pleasing to God, you and I are fully pleasing to God. Does it mean the things we do or don't do are always pleasing to him? No. But we are fully pleasing to him. He doesn't keep a record. So let me put it this way. We sin, right? We fail at times. We miss the mark, but it is not counted against us. Love keeps no record of wrongs. 1 Corinthians 13. Why? Because Jesus became our sin. He didn't even just take it on himself. According to what we've just read, he became our sin. He became our failure. He became our missing the mark. And all of that was put to death when he was. Back then, 2,000 years ago. Once. And by dying, he was released from the curse of all of our sin and failure and death. And so were we, because we're identified with him. And this is what baptism is about. This is Sunday with Mary. Like, that's what that's showing, is, is Jesus died. And in, in him dying, all of our failure, our sin, all of the percentage points that we are down was gone, is gone, washed away. And then we've been raised to new life in him, free from the curse of our sin and of our failure and then raised to the highest place, which is where we are with him now, in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, seated at the right hand of God. And that's all now. So we can truly say and confidently say, whether I'm on what I would regard as 20% or 99% or 101, we can say, I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I am justified before God. I am fully pleasing to God. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is who I am. We can throw the scorecard away because God doesn't have one. Right. Yes, Kate. The blood of Jesus continually washes us from all sin. Is that in the sense of what you're saying? I mean, you can look at it that way if you like. Yeah. 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 If you like, in terms of your your sort of daily interaction with God, but but I, I got to stress these points because they're the foundations, and I think, it, like I said at the beginning, I think it's it's foundational. It's quite hard for some people to actually let go of the performance mentality of the um, idea that God is measuring your performance. Because he's not. Okay, we're going to go on and illustrate this with a passage of scripture now. Hebrews 3, verses 1 to 6. 
just while you find that, I'll just repeat the verses we've already read. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you get it, Lee? Yeah, come out for Romans 8.1 as well. Yes. Yeah, therefore there is now no condemnation. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who shall bring any charge against those whom God has chosen. Who is there to condemn? It's Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised from the dead. We are more than conquerors. Yes. So hold on to your, hold on to your hats and let's go to Hebrews 3, verses 1 to 6. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honour than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that would be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Okay, so we're talking about Moses and about Jesus here. And they're being compared and contrasted. The law came through Moses. What came through Jesus? Grace and truth. John chapter 1. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. So there's a contrast being set up here between Moses, who represents the law, i.e. the percentage, the scorecard, and Jesus, who represents grace, which means God doing it for you, and truth, which means this is truly where you stand before God. Okay. So bear that in mind. Moses is the law. Jesus is grace and truth. But now we're going to look at the personalities of Moses and Jesus and what we learn from this here to do with what we're talking about tonight, which is how we're fully pleasing to God. So starting in verse one, therefore, holy brothers, holy brothers. So right there, straight off the bat, you're holy. But I've only got 50 percent. You're holy but I've only got 97%, you're holy, but I've only got 1%, you're holy. Holy brothers. Why are we brothers? Who are we brothers of, Lee? Christ. Christ, yes. So we're sharing his same genetic, his spiritual genetic, pleasing to God. So you've got pretty much the whole message in those two words there, holy brothers, but we'll go on. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling. What what are we called to? Fellowship with God the Father through Jesus. How could we have fellowship with a perfect holy God if his eyes were on our wrongdoing and our sin and our failure? It would be impossible. Instead, all that's gone into the sea of forgetfulness, washed away in the waters of baptism, all of our shortcoming. You who share in a heavenly calling, Consider Jesus. Okay, so let's consider Jesus, the apostle and the high priest of our confession. An apostle is like a pioneer. He's a trailblazer. He's a messenger. So he's the the trailblazer, the pioneer of our confession, and he's the high priest of our confession. The priest is one who brings man and God together. So Jesus is the trailblazer, the pioneer, the one who brings man and God together of our confession. Our confession is what we boldly declare, right? When we confess something, we're saying, this is the way it is. So Jesus is the trailblazer of our 
of our bold confession. Jesus, who is fully pleasing to God. He's the one that went first, that, that lived a life fully pleasing to God, that is fully pleasing to God because he's his son. He went first for us. And now we confess the same thing. I'm fully pleasing to God as his son in Christ Jesus. And he's the high priest of our confession. He's the one who brought us together with God and keeps us together with God. It's not based again on our performance. It's based on Jesus. That's how you can come to church and you could have failed miserably on the way to church, but you can walk in the door and you can lift your hands to God and you can begin to worship. And you can know I stand here clean and pure before my God. So Jesus, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him. So Jesus was faithful to him who appointed him. Jesus was faithful to God. God appointed him for a particular purpose, to come and save the world. And he was faithful to that. He fully lived it out. He achieved it. So Jesus was faithful, right? Just as Moses was also faithful in all of God's house. So Moses was faithful. Was he? Was Moses faithful, Kate? Well, God says he was. So even though he made mistakes, he was faithful. Yes, we got there. <laughs> right, what's God looking at? He's not looking at Moses' catastrophic shortcomings, largely the one right at the end when he, that led him to not be able to even go into the promised land. He's not looking at that. He's saying, my servant Moses, faithful in all my house. Right? So what about his failure? Where's that gone? Into the sea of forgetfulness. Washed away in the waters of baptism, in the sense that Jesus Christ died for Moses as well. It's just not there. His failure is just not there. Dead, gone, buried. Where's God's disappointment towards Moses here? There isn't any, is there? Where is the reprimand? It's not there. When God's looking at it, he's saying, faithful over all my house. Moses was faithful, it says. Going down to verse five, Moses was faithful in all God's house, that's amongst God's people, as a servant to testify to the things that would be spoken later. So we've now got a contrast being set up between Moses and Jesus. Moses was faithful, and he was faithful as a servant. A servant does his master's bidding. That's what a servant does. And he was faithful to do his master's bidding. And what was his master's bidding? To testify to the things that would be spoken later. So if you think of Moses, then what you get with Moses is a foretaste of what's going to come later. You've got all this law, all these requirements of God, good requirements, right? Right? Living requirements. The law was a good thing. It showed, look, this is a holy life. This is a pure life. This is a consecrated life. This is a set apart life. A good thing. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. All good stuff. And Moses, in giving the law, was giving a foretaste of the holiness of God. But later, the law and its requirements is all taken care of in Christ, who fulfilled the law for us. Right? So with Moses, you've got a foretaste of what's to come. With Jesus, you've got the reality. The law came through Moses. Grace, which is God doing it for you, and truth came through Jesus Christ. So with Moses, you've got the law. Then with Christ, you've got the law being fulfilled. And we are counted in Jesus as fully pleasing to God. The re righteous requirement of the law, fully fulfilled in us by faith. 
So once again, God doesn't measure your obedience. He doesn't have a scorecard or a results card or a percentage in mind. Yes, there's his will. Yes, there's what's right, there's what's wrong. Yes, there's such a thing as sin, failure, shortcoming. But God's not measuring all that because we're in Christ and Christ fulfilled it all on our behalf. So Moses was faithful, past tense, as a servant. Christ, it says in verse six, is faithful over God's house as a son. Moses was faithful, it's past, it's gone. Jesus Christ is faithful over God's people, God's house, as a son, not a servant, not just someone doing his master's bidding, but as a son. What's the difference there between the servant and the son? Yes, Kate. The servant is accepted on the basis of what he does and the son is accepted on the basis of who he is. Yes, thank you. The whole basis of Jesus' life and ministry is his father's love for him. The whole basis. Not what he does or doesn't do, but his father's love for him. That's the basis. Through Jesus and in Jesus, we stand as sons too. So the whole basis for our life and ministry is that we're sons. It's our father's love for us. So through Jesus and in Jesus, we stand as sons, but a certain kind of son, a son in whom the father is fully pleased. You know, if Jesus, and it wouldn't have happened, but if Jesus had failed, if he'd sinned, if he hadn't been fully pleasing to the father, then we would have no hope because we wouldn't be able to have him to identify with. We wouldn't have his righteousness to, to have been granted to us. We would have been, there'd very much have been the scorecard there. But Jesus did it for us. So, final verse, and we are his house. We are God's house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. So, what are we asked to do here? To hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. So our confidence in, in what? In Jesus. In the death of Jesus, all our sins have gone. Failures, shortcomings, all washed away. Confidence in the resurrection of Jesus, that we have been lifted up with him and placed in a position of relationship with God the Father. And confidence in the fact that in Jesus, we are fully pleasing to God. We're the righteousness of God, actually, in Jesus. Confidence in his death, his resurrection, and where we stand in him. And if we hold fast our boasting in our hope, what does it mean to boast? Be proud of it. To identify with it. Yeah. Thing that's successful and good. Yeah, proud of it. To, so proud that you're willing, to, you're willing to tell other people confidently, passionately. I am the goodness of God in Christ. God keeps no record of my wrongs. I have peace with God. I am justified before God. My father, my heavenly father is fully pleased with me because I am in his son who is fully pleasing to him. It's not 1%, it's not 50%, it's not 100%. It's, there's no percent anywhere to be seen with God. And then we go jump down just briefly to verse 14. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. When you were first a believer, if you, can, if you have a moment that you can look back to, did you know that you were forgiven? Did you know that you were clean before your Lord? Did you know that he was pleased with you in that moment? That's your original confidence. 
But then what happened? You know, well, we start walking with God and we start failing at times and missing the mark at times and succeeding at other times. And we start measuring everything in, in terms of that, our successes, our failures. But it's not what God, not how God does it. He measures it based on his son and that we are his sons through faith. So if we hold fast our confidence, then in our experience, we come to share in Christ. He's already ours and we're already his, but we actually experience that, the Father's pleasure and so on. Why? How? Because we get it all right all the time. No, but because we hold fast our confidence in him. So one final scripture, um, Galatians chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. Galatians 3, 25 and 26. Do you see now, while you're looking, do you see now why God is never disappointed with you? It's not only because he knows the future anyway, so in that sense he can't be disappointed, but he's just never disappointed because you're in Jesus. And all the sins and shortcomings and failures and stuff was taken care of on the cross in his death. He told Peter it's counterintuitive in a secular world, isn't it? Yes. You know, if you think you made a mess of it, you think somebody's going to judge you for it. Yes. In the secular world, anyway. Yes, that's right. The other thing that just bothered me slightly. Yes. Obviously, before Jesus Christ, the Jews were punished repeatedly mm -hmm. for their wrongdoings mm -hmm. and lack of faith, etc., etc. But since so that was an episode before Christ. Yeah. So the whole situation changed after. That, that's the difference, is it? Okay, so <clears throat> look at someone like David, who we're told was a man after God's own heart, but he committed some horrific sins. And he paid a consequence for that in his life, which was somewhat the natural consequence of his of his wrongdoing. The Lord allowed him to reap some of what he'd sowed. But he's still declared as a man after God's own heart. And his salvation is still based on what Jesus was going to do, you know, a thousand years later. Or Moses, we've just looked at Moses, you know, yeah, he didn't get to go into the promised land. But when God looks at it, he says, but he was faithful. God has forgotten that sin based on what Jesus did. So if the, I can see why you're asking the question. It's like, why, why then were they punished? You know, and are we not punished? Well, I think God does punish us, actually. I think he does punish us for our sins in the sense that he disciplines us. You know, there are times where he says, well, you're not going into the promised land because you've disobeyed me. But he's not measuring us in that way of, well, you've got this percent, you've got that percent, and... We're actually, we're actually pleasing to him in Christ. It doesn't mean all that we do is pleasing to him or all that we uh, don't do is pleasing. Yes, Kate? Something um, that um, helps me or that um, well, I feel like God's been trying to um, get through to me for some time on, uh, along those lines is that when God disciplines us, he doesn't discipline us like, a natural um, person would. So we're still, his motive is always love and it's always the best for us. So he doesn't have a half with us and then, you know, correct us. So in that sense, we're always fully pleasing to him. So when he's correcting us, he's correcting us for our own benefit and his motives are always entirely pure. Um, so I think sometimes when we think about being corrected, we think, oh, God must be kind of annoyed with us because he's correcting us, or do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas, in fact, it's the opposite. He's correcting us because he loves us. Yeah, annoyed or disappointed. Yes, or disappointed. And that's a biggie. Like, that's he's like, never disappointed. I was just going to say, it's, it's just like the Garden of Eden. Like, yes. It wasn't, like, angry at Adam and Eve. Okay, no. They put them themselves and leave, didn't they? And mm -hmm. from God, but God still sought them out. Yes. And yeah. then presided his redemption in Jesus. Yeah. yeah. He made them clothes yeah. even, didn't he? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So he wasn't disappointed or saying, oh, well, you've missed the mark there. It was just like, 
Where are you? Yeah. Where are you? Yeah, you've you've gonna, there's going to be consequences for what you've done. But even in that, I'm going to step in to make a way for you. So last verse, Galatians three twenty five to twenty six, and this is a whole passage which we won't read now, but about the law as compared to faith. So again, Moses compared to Jesus, right? Now that faith has come. We are no longer under a guardian. The guardian is the law, right? For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So it's all about faith. You know, we've put our trust in Jesus. So we're not under the law. We're not under a guardian that's saying, thou shalt, thou shalt not. Here's the standard. Oh, look, you failed it. We're just not under that. Instead, in Christ Jesus... We are all sons of God through faith. And so once again, Jesus as a son was fully pleasing to his father. And we're in Christ Jesus. And we have, in the same sense, we're fully pleasing to God. And how is that? It's through faith. And so I know there have been a lot of questions raised this evening about, yes, but what about when we do sin? And what about if God does discipline us? But the fact is that if we're well-grounded, in the truth that we're looking at tonight, the truth of being justified before God, the truth of having being at peace with God, the truth of being the righteousness of God in Christ, the truth of being regarded as faithful, right, despite our failures. If we're well grounded in that, in that fact that there is no scorecard, there's no disappointment, etc., if we're well grounded, then we're actually free to follow the Holy Spirit, which is what we're told that sons do. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Whereas if we're living, even in a small way, under the image of the law, of that scorecard, of that percentage, if we're living even in a small way under that, then it just makes it that little bit harder to run with the Holy Spirit, to be led by him, to go with him, and to be fruitful for God. Yeah? Yeah, this should propel us forward, actually. Yes. Not just leave us and walk, and we're like, we should be running, as you say, like as new creations, because there's no room in a new creation for this mentality, really. Exactly. That's what I'm going to say, really. Yes. Yeah, it's just exciting, isn't it? Really? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, it is. So let's dwell on that. <laughs> And throw away the, if you've got one, you know, it's somewhere in your psyche, then just throw it away, the the performance rating or the scorecard. No place for it in our lives, as as Lee said, as new creations. Time to run. It's really good news. It is good news. Gospel. (laughs) Yes, really good news.